Hi everybody, welcome back to the 10th of an hour with Griffin Bridgers. For today's episode, episode 117, I'm going to introduce a three-part mini-series where we talk about ing trusts. Now when I say ing trusts, what I'm referring to isn't a trust that has uh, a suffix you attach to an action verb uh, in the English language. Instead, what we're referring to is a trust that's known as an incomplete non-grantor trust. That's what ing stands for. And in this three-part series, we're going to dive into kind of the high-level considerations, but there is no way we can cover all the bases here because they're so state-specific. But we're going to break this down into three parts. And for part one, we're going to look at the basic features and considerations. Now, as always, this presentation is not intended to substitute for legal or tax advice and is provided for educational purposes only. Now, to provide you a roadmap to this series, uh, part one is going to look at basic considerations, as I mentioned today, like grantor access, choice of state, trustee, and assets. Then the technical tax aspects are going to be covered in part two and three. In part two, we're going to look at gift tax considerations, where we aim to make transfers to the trust incomplete gifts for gift tax purposes. And then in part three, we're going to look to income tax considerations where we look to make the trust a non-grantor trust. And we're going to dive into a private letter ruling, which is commonly cited as the uh, first in a line of safe harbor types of rulings that look to the general structure of this type of trust. Now, as I mentioned with the incomplete and non-grantor features, that gives you a hint as to what ING stands for. It's an incomplete non-grantor trust, as noted on the first bullet point. Now, the ING trust is an irrevocable trust, and it's created with two objectives. One is that you are looking to avail yourself of the protections of a state that's different from your own state of domicile, and that different state should, one, recognize self-settled asset protection trusts, which are known as domestic asset protection trusts, or DAPTs, and typically you're going to want to have a state that also doesn't have an income tax, because the intent here is to change the source of trust income to the state which has no income tax, or at the very least a lower income tax than the grantor state of domicile or business. So you get asset protection and you could remove state income tax on the income generated by the trust assets. So if you want to maximize both these objectives, you have to find a state which has both domestic asset protection trust statutes on its books and no income tax. Now, this isn't necessarily an all-inclusive list of the options, but the common states top of the bell curve that are used are Delaware, Nevada, Tennessee as of January 1st, and Wyoming. So the trust income usually identifies the state. So if you see a DING, that's a Delaware incomplete non-grantor trust. You also have NINGS for Nevada, TINGS for Tennessee, WINGS for Wyoming, so on and so forth. So. When it comes to this type of trust, the biggest question from a client, typically the client is going to be the grantor of the trust, is what level of access does that grantor have to the trust assets? And that level of access is also going to drive the level of asset protection and the argument you can make that the income should not be subject to income tax in the grantor's state of domicile. Now, both those are issues we'll look at in part three and in part two for that matter, but for a trust like a SLAT where the spouse has access as a beneficiary but maybe the grantor doesn't, the grantor may be able to indirectly benefit as a natural result of the marital relationship without actually being a beneficiary of the trust. But the income to the spouse could make this a grantor trust under code section 677. I talked about that issue in episode 96, so that's a good listen if you want to go back to that. So you may have to build in some non-grantor back doors if you want to have that indirect access. But if you want the grantor to have maybe direct access, uh, not necessarily by power or authority, but by the power or authority of others like fiduciaries or beneficiaries, then you might have to advance this from a slat to a more comprehensive type of trust. 
and we'll cover that grantor access in greater detail in part three. And the threshold question is really going to be whether the grantor's access will be subject to a fiduciary or a non-fiduciary standard. Now the client may balk at a non-fiduciary standard because it's not legally enforceable, but that lack of legal enforceability is ultimately the cost and the carrot that will give you the ability to gain the protections that are inherent in the ing trust now choice of site estate is important as i mentioned earlier top of the bell curve is going to be a state that has both dapt statutes and no income tax or at least lower income tax and in order to gain that protection you're going to have to name a trustee from the very outset in that trust uh, site estate, and it wouldn't necessarily have to be from the outset. You could always move a trust to that DAPT state in the future, but uh, either way, a lot of clients tend to balk at the fees of an out-of-state trustee and also the control of the out-of-state trustee as well. But as I mentioned, um, one feature we're going to have is that we can strip away some of the fiduciary protections as a way to gain some of the uh, other benefits like asset protection and lower income tax on the state level that we talked about. So what part three is going to uh, introduce is the concept of vesting distribution authority maybe in beneficiaries or adverse parties to the trust and taking that away from the trustee or making the trustee be directed by those adverse parties. So outside of that, when we're looking at DAPT trusts and there's various issues that could arise which are well outside the scope of this discussion which I could talk about forever but those are largely state specific things like fraudulent or voidable transfer laws conflict of laws issues public policy issues with asset protection and even those could be dependent on the types of claims which could arise so that aside when it comes time to choose assets the big picture is that what we want to avoid is any argument that the high tax state could make that the income of the trust is actually sourced from that high tax state because that's the hook that would allow that high tax state to tax the undistributed income of that ing trust. So for that reason, the ing trust is typically funded with personal property and not with real property or real estate because location ultimately drives source income. If you can remove the ownership and location of personal property from the high tax state and place it in the hands of a trustee in the low or no income tax state, that could strip away that source income argument. Whereas real estate always has a static location. So any income generated by real estate is always going to be sourced to the state in which that real estate is located. Now, there's many considerations to take into account, but typically the best assets here would be portfolio securities. You could use family business interests as well, but there's um, some considerations. You may have to look through the family entity to dive deeper into source income considerations. For example, if you had an entity that owned real estate, it would be hard to move the situs of the entity and avoid the source income tax issues just because uh, maybe by corporate level income tax or by pass through K-1 type of income, you'd still have source income to the trust. So that wouldn't be a perfect uh, solution. Now, if you have an ing that's being created for a one-time liquidity event and not for ongoing income, it's important also to try to fund the trust well in advance of any sort of uh, binding commitment or obligation to sell or exchange the trust assets. Otherwise, what could happen is the high tax state could assert an assignment of income claim and claim that even though the grantor wasn't the owner of the assets at the time of closing, that binding commitment entered into by the grantor causes the grantor to be treated as if they sold the asset, received the cash income, and then assigned that cash income to the trust which would still cause that same source tax issue. Then finally, the intent is that this transfer of the assets to the trustee out of state would not generate gift tax or generation skipping transfer tax, and we'll cover how to do so in part two. As always, if you have questions or topic suggestions, you can email those to me at griffin.bridgers at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to this episode of the 10th of an hour. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one.